So my, my talk will be about uh, ethical publishing and how we get there. And this is gonna be largely uh, covering on topics uh, of a paper that, that we recently published in uh, PTP Bio, uh, together with Thomas and Denis, as well as a very, very, very nice team of uh, people that are heavily involved in the ethics of, of publishing and, and research in general, uh, Nicolas Galtier, uh, Veronique de Herd, uh, Noemi Bonn, Ben Phillips, as well as Tuma and Denis. Uh, and it was really a, a pleasure to, to write this article. Uh, it was a very, very nice uh, experience. You can find it uh, online. Uh, so I'll start with, uh, when, whenever I usually give this talk, I start with a simple question is how much does a scientific paper cost? Uh, and uh, the, the, the example that I give is uh, this particular journal, Nature Human Behavior. There's a lot of topical nature journals. Uh, I think the last talk I gave was in a psychology department, so that's why I'm choosing this one. But you know, there's also Nature Ecology and Evolution, many other uh, nature journals uh, with similar uh, publication structures. Uh, and the important thing here is to understand uh, to whom is that cost uh, dumped on when we talk about costs of scientific papers. So if we start with thinking about uh, the cost to scientists of publishing, say, open access in uh, nature, human behavior, or nature, uh, ecology, and evolution, well, those costs are, are published in the, the website of, of this journal. Uh, and if you want a gold open access uh, publication, I'll talk about a bit more in detail about what they mean by gold open access. The cost of publishing in, in nature, human behavior, and this is the same in, in many other nature topical journals, it's uh, almost 10,000 uh, euros. Uh, one may choose to pay less, and so the paper might be paywalled, and so the reader then bears the cost of reading the article. And in that case, again, I'm, I'm just grabbing screenshots from, from this journal, you can buy the article for $32 or subscribe to the journal for 140 uh, euros. Now, I think the real important cost here is the cost to nature human behavior of publishing uh, that paper. And there's, there's been several studies sort of estimating what, what, this, what it would cost to, to, to publish a, a paper in a journal as, as such. And the estimate ranges between 30 and, and 300 euros. So you can see that uh, you know, in, the, in the worst case scenario, uh, with, with about 10 articles, uh, nature human behavior is already recouping the costs of, of publication. Best case scenario with just one article, uh, with just one person buying the article, you're, you're already recouping the full costs. Um, and then, then the question is, how did this come to be? How did we come to be in this situation where one would have to pay 10,000 euros to, to make this journal open access to, to readers? Well, the, journal, the, the article itself uh, costs somewhere between 30 and 300 euros. Uh, and for this, we need a little bit of, of history. Uh, so I'll start with, with, with thinking about society publishing. So the traditional mode of scientific publishing um, that, that was mostly in, in vogue until maybe the last 30, 20 years and has been less and less popular over the last few decades. Um, in this scenario, taxpayers, uh, public institutions, sometimes private foundations give money to, to scientists. And then the scientists um, puts labor as well as uh, some of the money that comes through these public ins and private institutions into research and produces a manuscript reporting on the results of that research. And here I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about money flows. I'm gonna uh, depict this with, with green arrows. I'm gonna talk about labor flows. I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna depict that with, with red arrows. Then that manuscript might go through a, a peer review process. So some other scientists might donate their free labor uh, into providing peer review. And then that goes through a paywall. And then if a reader wants to read that and, and cross the paywall, then they have to provide uh, money to the journal. And traditionally that money would go to uh, running costs for the journal, like copy editing and dissemination, uh, as well as society costs. So like organizing conferences every year, uh, having field specific uh, grants or, or scholarships that might benefit uh, other academics within the same uh, field. And that way the, the article would be available to, to readers. Uh, increasingly, uh, that's not the sort of the dominant uh, publication model. Uh, uh, about 50% of, of papers today are, are controlled by five uh, dominant uh, big commercial uh, publication houses. Uh, and this has been, uh, this is a trend that has been going on for, for at least three decades. It applies in the natural sciences, but it's also happening in the social sciences and the humanities. This comes from a, an article by Larivier, a very good article on, on, on uh, 
publishing structures in academia. Um, and this also happens across different subfields within the sciences, whether we talk about biology, chemistry, physics, math, uh, we see an increasing number of, of articles being controlled by these large dominant uh, commercial publishing houses. Largely, this is due because big publishing houses are acquiring uh, small publishing houses. Uh, and this is a trend that has particularly accelerated since the early 1990s. So, more and more, it's not society publishing the, the dominant uh, publishing model uh, that has sort of come to emerge in the last few decades, but commercial publishing, where uh, money flows through uh, for, from, from readers to, to access a paywall are not going entirely or, or mostly not going to paying for society costs, but are going to the pockets of, of shareholders of these big publishing houses. Uh, with journal digitalization, um, the, the process has changed a bit, so it's, it's, uh, it's now more and more popular to, to publish an article, obviously, on, online, uh, and so many journals are completely online, they don't have a, a paper version, uh, and because of that, journal costs through copy editing and dissemination have, have decreased substantially in the last few decades, um, but this has not meant that articles have become cheaper to readers. Actually, most of that has been absorbed uh, as profit by shareholders. And so articles have either remained uh, at the same or higher costs than they were before the process of, of online digitalization. And so you end up with a, with a situation where these large publishing houses like El Xavier or Taylor and Francis have amazingly uh, large profit margins uh, on the order of 35 to 40%, much larger than you know, the biggest corporations you can think of like Amazon or, or Google or Apple. Uh, I'm adding here the Nature Publishing Group, which is similar, uh, very, very high uh, profit margins, money going uh, away from academia and into pockets of, of shareholders. Uh, the, there, there were several open access initiatives that emerged particularly at the beginning uh, uh, of the last decade and the decade before that, that was aiming to, to address this problem. And in this scenario, you would make an article uh, open access so readers wouldn't have to pay uh, to, to access an article. But this arrow, this money flow going from the journal to shareholders has remained steady or increased. And the way this has happened is that the, the costs of publication are increasingly absorbed by uh, scientists. And that actually means that they're increasingly absorbed by society, uh, society um, in terms of, of, of taxes that are going into research. So this is money going from, from uh, society into scientists, but then going uh, diverted to the pockets of shareholders rather than remaining within academia. Uh, and this process has become uh, sort of a runaway process, particularly for particular journals like Nature Human Behavior. We see cases where shareholders have amazingly large uh, profits, largely because scientists are having to pay humongous amounts of money to, to have their manuscript published in these journals. Um, and so this points to, to the fact that not all open access is created equal. Uh, particular forms of open access are still leading resources to be funneled away from academia and into uh, the pockets of shareholders. Um, and gold open access is, is an example of that. Uh, so, so my main point throughout this, this, this talk is that not all open access is, is created equal. Um, when when figuring, out, figuring it out where one may want to publish an article, and this is an important conversation that should be had before a project even starts, um, one important thing that we should ask ourselves is in what way will my article be open for others to read? And you know, you can think about a, a completely closed access journal to a fully open access journal. But another important dimension that we considered in our paper is what's the journal's economic model? Where does the money come from and where does it end up? Uh, and here it might range from a completely for-profit system to a non-profit but still commercial system that, that is driven by the similar motivations as the for-profit system and then to a fully non-commercial system. And so within these two dimensions, you might find different categories of uh, journals that might have different trade-offs. Category one here, this is at least desirable, you know, the article remains close um, and uh, money is still funneled away from, from academia. 
Uh, you might have a situation where you have an open access article, but that means that a lot of research money is going to uh, to uh, the, the cost of, of having an article published uh, gold open access. There might also be a, another category in which the article is, is cheap to, to publish, but remains closed access because it still has uh, a paywall. And here is the most desirable category four, uh, where the article is fully open access and, and resources are not funneled away from academia. Uh, this is uh, this category is also called diamond open access. Uh, it's an ideal model um, that keeps APCs uh, at zero or low as, as low as possible, so that the journal operates at cost and research resources remain within the academic domain. Uh, another dimension we might think about, and there's many dimensions here, we're just talking about a few of them, is what's the journal's ownership structure. You, know, you might have a journal that is uh, associated with a society, and perhaps some of the costs for, for publication are going to uh, society schemes that might benefit academics within the field, uh, which is also a very positive thing. Uh, if you're wondering nature, human behavior, and a lot of these not nature topical journals fall within category two, which is yes, open access, but still funneling resources away from, from academia. I'd like to focus on this diamond open access category because I think it's, it's, it's one of the most ideal categories for, or if not the most ideal category of, of journal model. Uh, in this journal model, authors retain their copyright. You have a peer reviewed publication and it's both free for readers and, and authors, uh, which is really nice. Um, uh, how does how does it work? Well, it's not magic. Uh, the article is open access, but there's still costs associated with uh, journal publication, like copy editing and dissemination. The costs, though, are coming directly from uh, social, uh, sorry, public institutions as well as some private foundations, depending on on the particular type of diamond open access journal. Uh, and then the, the important thing here is that we are bypassing the scientists as the person in charge of providing money. Uh, to the journal. Uh, the scientist is driven by perhaps different motivations than uh, society, and society might not want to have their money funneled away from, from what it was originally meant to be, which was uh, research. You might also think of a, a slightly modified version of this, where you have a diamond open access journal, but it's supported or associated with a society, so that some of the costs uh, might also go to, to organizing conferences and, and grants for the society as well. There's many diamond open access journals out there and, and several are, are emerging. Uh, I'm here putting a, a few examples of them across different fields, uh, but the really big powerhouse uh, of, of diamond open access uh, publications, which I think has opened a lot of doors uh, for, for scientists in, in several uh, fields is the peer community journal and the associated peer community initiatives. Um, I think this has really been a, a game changer for, for academic publications in terms of, of popularizing uh, alternative publication systems, separating peer review from the actual publication and also making uh, publication free for both readers and uh, authors. Um, and uh, as uh, Marjolaine said, I'm, I am I'm highly involved in, in this uh, system as a, as a volunteer because I really believe this is a, a system that we should be promoting in our scientific circles. Um, and the people that have been uh, the original um, proponents of the system uh, I'm really thankful for them. I mean, they, they really deserve recognition for, for having the, the, the vision to, to organize something like this at, at scale in, in, in different fields across academia. Now, the question then is why would we want the gold model instead? Why does the gold model uh, persist in academia? Uh, and again, that's just a reminder, the gold model is, is a model in which we have open access publications, but a lot of the, the the costs uh, of, of publication are, are being funneled into uh, shareholder uh, pockets. And this an example of this is nature, human behavior or nature, ecology and evolution. Now, the thing is once the, the publication is completely decoupled from what the service that is being provided when what you're actually buying is just the prestige label, well, then you have runaway behaviors, right? So a prestige label can have an arbitrary price because it's up to the journal itself to determine how, how big of a, of a price that prestige is uh, to, to, to be purchased. Um, and this is what has led to, to the process where shareholders can, can or the, the companies uh, that are servicing shareholders can put uh, humongously large prices associated to these journals 
because they know that scientists under under academic pressures are are willing to pay that that price. This is contributing to increasing lack of access you know, across academia. Uh, you know the the, the spending on, on journals because of, of this increased publication cost has, has greatly outpaced inflation. Uh, and this means that, that uh, academic libraries across the world, particularly in the global south, uh, where resources are less available, um, are having a very, very hard time keeping up with uh, the, the latest scientific findings because it's just very costly uh, to, to, access, uh, to, to access these publications. Um, and so the, the, the main point of this is that the problem is not just about publishing. It, it goes deeper into the academic motivations that have been established in our systems. Um, and it's ultimately about this prestige hierarchy that has been established and promoted by these big publishing companies, uh, sort of created the, the idea that some uh, journals have greater uh, value uh, than others, even when the, the peer review uh, is done by the same people. Uh, and so a lot of these publishing houses have come to associate in particular words like impact, excellence, top, authoritative, to their publications and have let these, these words sort of spread across academia, um, which has set them apart from, from everything else. This is also a part of a process of increased corporatization of, of the academic world, which has happened over the last 30 years. Um, uh, a very good article on, on this topic is by Kayar Tal from, from last year, which points to the different uh, motivations that push academics to, to try to acquire these prestige labels. You know, there's less funding, uh, fewer jobs, there's increased precariousness of, of academia, and there's increased competition. Competition is something that is actually promoted to an extreme degree in academia. This also leads to an over-reliance on uh, performance metrics, uh, like journal prestige, which often have very little to do with the actual scientific content of publications. And this leads to more papers uh, being produced by the publishing industry, and particularly for, for papers to be uh, favored if they have these associated prestige labels associated with them. So the main take home message from this is that it's not only about open access, it's not only open access that we should be promoting in academia. Uh, the, the problems are deeper and they have to do with labor precarity, capital accumulation, and this manufacturing of, of prestige uh, that has spread across uh, many uh, academic fields. Uh, and so in our, in our paper, we, we, we set out to answer, you know, what can we do as, as academics to address all these, these, these problems? And it sometimes things feels in academia like, you know, we're, we're small fish that are trying to compete with one another. Uh, and so we just submit to, to these big systems because we know there's, no, there's no way out. But actually there's a lot we can do if we organize through the power of, of, of collective action we can actually take a lot of power away from these big publishing houses that are, that are preying upon us. Um, and in, in our paper, we list sort of uh, seven main uh, points of, of action that, that we can undertake to, to address these very systemic problems in both publishing and, and deep, more deeply in, in academia. And I'm gonna focus on, on each of them in turn. And the first one has to do with, with recognizing our specific leadership roles and, and leverage points. Where in, in the academic system are we, uh, we situated and what uh, levers do we have to influence our peers and our colleagues? Um, and you know, if I, one is a PhD student, you might think, oh, you don't have a ton of power, but you know, you, your PI might listen to your concerns and might change their, their behavior. If you're a, uh, a researcher in uh, society, uh, 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 committee or in a grant committee, there's a lot you can do to influence the, the behavior of particular academic organizations in a more, more ethical direction. Uh, uh, there's a very uh, thorough amount of work by Danella Meadows on, on leverage points in, in different parts of a system that can help change the system. Uh, this is reviewed in a paper by Hussein in 2021. There's, I would say the, the PCI system is somewhere around here. It's, it's, it's and associated don't, diamond open access uh, systems are, are changing the way we communicate, are changing the amount of information we have, they're changing the rules of the system. And we're, we're moving towards perhaps changing the structure and, and the goals of, of the system. But it's really trying to find these important leverage points in the system that can help tip the system in a different direction. 
Now, once we sort of recognize where we're situated in academia, the, the first thing we need to do is let people know our concerns, talk openly about these problems in academia, not shy, shy away from them. Uh, and as we talk openly, one of the important things that we need to try to avoid is avoid shaming and blaming individuals. Uh, uh, we're all embedded in the system and we're all influenced by the system. I have benefited from, from commercial publishing throughout my, my career, but that doesn't mean that, that we shouldn't act to, to improve the system for those that, that, that are coming uh, after us. Um, and it, it's also usually better to, to, uh, to recognize these, these existing pressures all throughout academia if we want to change the behavior of those around us. Uh, another thing we would try to avoid is, is sort of tennis-like dynamics. I've often found myself in situations where I'm, you know, I'm talking to, to top, uh, here I'm using another adjective I shouldn't be using, to particular academics in my field that have a lot of influence. Um, and they might, might blame the, the pressure they have on, on publishing in this particular commercial journals on funding agencies, which once you want to talk to the funding agencies, they might say, oh, we're, we're benefiting the system, we're supporting the system, because you know, the, the big names in, in the field are, are still supporting the system. So you end up with a situation where the, the blame gets passed on from one side to another. Uh, and a good way outside of this is by putting people from different parts of the system together in a room uh, to talk simultaneously about this, this problem. Uh, but I think the most important thing we need to do is to uh, organize and engage in collective action. So, so to team up to, to address uh, this problem. Uh, and uh, I think the peer community system has done quite a lot in that direction. One of the things they, they advanced is the, the PCI manifesto, which was uh, released, I think last year, uh, with the goal of uh, people openly signing a manifesto saying, you know, if we reach a certain number of signatures, then everybody that sign will publish their, their uh, paper on, on uh, the peer community system and eventually the peer community journal. Um, and this, this manifesto really surpassed the, the author's expectations. They were originally aiming for 500 researchers. Uh, and I, this, this image is already outdated. It's now past 1,000 uh, signatories to, to this manifesto. And this shows that once you know that other people are, are ready to act, uh, you, you will also be motivated to act yourself. Uh, and it also motivated me to act. I now have two uh, papers under review in, in the PCI system because I, I signed the system. There are several, actually several people in my group that, that signed this manifesto as well. Um, Statements of support by foundations, libraries, and scientific institutions help a lot. You know, having these institutions say that these are these are systems that we would like to 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 push forward. Um, and so, if if you are in in any of these institutions, in any particular foundation or or scientific institution with power, it's important that you're open about the, the promotion of, of of systems that are, allow research money to stay within academia. Uh, there's also been calls for, for diamond open access through, through the, the, the Plan S uh, to work collectively towards community-driven and academic-led uh, publishing models. There's also been statements of support by, by foundations. Uh, for example, the, the, the Max Planck uh, uh, Institute has, has stood in support of the, the Peer Community Initiative. The CNRS has, has stood in support of diamond open access system. And this, again, sends signal to others that you know, the big actors in the system are ready to support this. And this makes sense because the, these foundations have a stake in, in keeping money within academia because they are providing researchers with, with money through various grant schemes. Um, we can also do other, other things to turn, send a social signal to others that, that these commercial uh, journals are, are extracting money and, and labor away from us for, for free. And one of those is by withdrawing the free labor that we provide to them through our peer review or our uh, editing uh, obligations. Um, and you know, here it's, it's focusing on this particular part of, of the system. It's a scientist that is, is donating their labor for free in order to, to peer review the paper. Obviously, you know, peer review is, is, a, is an important aspect of, 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 of publishing. Uh, and it's something that we should, as a community, uh, you know, try to do, to comment and, and, and try to improve uh, the, the work of our peers. But this shouldn't come at the expense of uh, uh, the, the abuse of, of, of other scientists with, that are placed within the system. Several people uh, are putting out um, you know, their, their letters to the editors that they're, that they're submitting whenever they get a request for a review in, in some of these commercial journals, saying that they're refusing to review for this journal, uh, obviously hiding the name of, of the authors involved. 
But I think it's important that, that these, these things are, are made public saying, look, uh, I am refusing to review. Uh, and, and, and this is it's a way for other people, particularly people with less power in the system, like, like students and postdocs to, to see that, that many people are willing to, to say that this is, this is not um, acceptable. Uh, I've done this, this myself. Uh, one important thing, I think, in addition to publishing uh, you know, a letter to, to, to the editor saying that you're refusing to review is to uh, perhaps send an email to the authors that originally asked you to, to be peer reviewer or suggested you as a peer reviewer uh, to explain why you're doing what you're doing. I did this once and I actually was able to provide an alternative peer review through a, a preprint system uh, instead of, of going through the, the commercial journal route. And, and it was a very nice experience, both with uh, the editors, sorry, with the authors and, and with the public at large. Um, we also have to support healthier alternatives. Um, the Nicola Galtier has, has uh, helped construct a database of academia-friendly journals in ecology and, and evolution. Uh, so in, in my particular field, at least, there's this very nice resource showing which are journals that are actually keeping money within academia, you can classify different journals by their business model, by how they, they choose to publish their research, and how much uh, APC they, they require from their authors. Uh, and uh, this doesn't exist for all fields, but I think it's something that is worth trying to pursue in other fields beyond ecology and evolution, because it's a way for, for more information to circulate so that one knows what are the, those journals that are actually uh, positively acting to, to, to help other academics rather than expecting money or labor away from them. Um, and Nicola they made this nice analysis in our paper showing that uh, for different amounts of uh, society and nonprofit journal usage, you know, people that mostly publish in commercial journals versus people that mostly publish in, in non-commercial or society journals, there really is not much of a difference in terms of total uh, citation counts, regardless of one, whether one is a professor, an associate professor, or an assistant professor. This is only done at the level of, of faculty. Um, he also showed that regardless of, of your age, uh, your, your age index uh, as a function of age uh, is not significantly different whether one publishes predominantly in uh, commercial journals versus in nonprofit or society journals. Uh, we can also discuss switching to ethical publishing with, with existing journal owners. There's many society journals that are in association with these commercial publishing houses. Um, uh, and many are, are choosing to disengage from them, sometimes uh, by, by stopping their partnerships, sometimes when they're owned by one of these publishing houses by completely quitting en masse. Uh, an example of this is the Lingua Journal. Uh, the, the six editors and the entire editorial board of Lingua uh, resigned uh, together collectively to protest these super high uh, prices that El Savior is, is putting on them. They created a, a new journal called Glossa. It's a diamond open access journal. And they're doing much better now than they were doing uh, when, when they were running this other journal under El Savior. So I think this is a really nice uh, success story of what we can do when we act collectively. And it's not the only success story. Uh, I'm putting a link here, uh, I think will be shared when this, when this talk goes online, um, of uh, what are called journal declarations of independence. So this is from the open access directory. Uh, journals choosing to disengage or quit en masse from a, a dominant commercial publisher uh, and creating their own open access or diamond open access uh, publication. This has been happening from the, for the last uh, 30 years, and there's a lot of success stories of, of particular editorial boards that are doing quite well independently from the big commercial publishers. Uh, we can also promote ethical behavior by focusing on science and not journal names, particularly in our everyday conversations, you know, in our, in our coffee chats, in our, in our journal clubs. Uh, because ultimately what it comes down to is this prestige hierarchy, this idea that you know, some journals are more impactful or more excellent, whatever that means, than others. Um, and I think one thing that helps to, to topple down that pyramid is to uh, address what these commercial publishing houses really are, which is profiteering, exploitative, outrageous, and money draining. So associating adjectives that address the, the problems associated with these journals when talking about the journals, rather than putting them on a pedestal. So I hope I have conveyed that there's actually quite a lot that, that we can do uh, to uh, uh, promote ethical publishing in our various academic uh, circles. Uh, if you want to read more about this, I encourage you to check out uh, this, this publication on ethical publishing and how we get there. It was originally preprinted. 
uh, in Sonodo, uh, and then we submitted it for peer review in an op diamond open access journal called PTP Bio, Philosophy, Theory, and Practice in Biology, and that's a, a diamond open access journal. It was a very nice experience, uh, both uh, in terms of uh, our, our experience with the peer reviewers and, and with the editor, and it was a very quick uh, turnaround after the, the peer reviews came in. So, so I really encourage you to, to try out this and other diamond open access journals uh, within your field. And if there isn't a diamond open access journal in your field, consider uh, promoting or starting one. Okay, so that's uh, uh, as much as I'm gonna talk about that particular paper, um, but I still wanna devote a few more slides to a separate topic that is partly related to what I just talked about. Um, so it's one last thing I want to talk about. It's something that I'm really excited about. Um, and it has to do with taking the long view. So, so far, you know, I've only talked about academic systems uh, and uh, issues that mostly concern us as academics and, and the people that read our, our literature, our scientific literature. Um, but I think it's also good to take a, a bit of a, a broader view outside of the ivory tower of, of where we're situated. Um, there's, there's honestly two trends that keep me awake at night, and one of them is, is this one, this increasing control by uh, big publishing houses uh, of the different outputs that we make in, in our different fields. But this is not the, the, the biggest trend that keeps me awake at night. There's a bigger uh, problem that keeps me awake at night, which is the, the warming of our planets and the increasingly dire uh, both climate and ecological situation we find ourselves in as we pump more fossil fuels into, into our atmosphere as we destroy the ecological systems that have supported us for, for millennia, uh, and we enter a, a planet, a planetary system that is very different from, from the one in which uh, we, we have spent most of our history. Uh, and this is something that is, is affecting us even now, and I mean now like this week, uh, I don't know if you know, but there's a big drought happening in, in Europe. Uh, this is a map of uh, areas of France affected by droughts, uh, comparing 2021, 2022, and 2023. Uh, and this is a, a drought that is affecting not just France, but also parts of, of uh, Greece, Turkey, the UK, and Spain. Um, and this will essentially mean that, that food prices will go up because there's going to be less food available for us to, to, to consume. We're, in, we're seeing increasing risks of, of droughts as well as famines around the world. Um, and there's predictions for, for mass crop failures uh, in, in the next few years as, as the planet warms up and we're less and less able to support uh, the, the, the crops that we have, that, that we have around the world. Um, the, the climate and ecological catastrophe is also leading to the mass displacement of, of people, a uh, large number of climate migrants. You know, the IPCC uh, predicts that about a billion climate migrants will exist by the, by the end of the century. That's a lot of people that will have to leave their homes uh, and find them, themselves in, in, in a new place. And you, know, you can't displace so many people without that leading to, to conflict and ultimately war. So, so we're increasingly moving to a very, very dangerous uh, situation as we pump more and more fossil fuels into the atmosphere. And I'm saying this because I, I was recently also uh, co-authoring a paper uh, with several other scientists where we call for scientists to change our behaviors, our tactics to address the biospheric emergency. Uh, to, to more broadly engage with advocacy and, and activism. And we're not the only ones saying this. There's increasing calls by several uh, groups of scientists uh, calling on, on scientists to engage in activism, to engage in particularly uh, disruptive forms of activism like civil disobedience, and to rethink our academic structures to address the climate and ecological emergency that we found ourselves in. Um, uh, a very prominent uh, example of this is the Scientist Rebellion Movement, of which I'm a part of. Um, these are scientists that engage in, in peaceful protests, sometimes walking down the road, sometimes blocking a building or blocking a street, calling on governments and, and corporations to, to do what they haven't done for the last 30 years, which is addressing the, the climate and ecological emergency. This is a picture from, from, uh, from a few weeks ago. Uh, we were about 100 scientists in, in the Netherlands calling for the government to stop funding uh, new uh, fossil fuel uh, investments. Uh, and they, their response was that they got uh, water cannoned by the police and several of them were arrested. Uh, so I encourage you to check out this, this group, scientistsrebellion.com, uh, because we need as many people, as many scientists as possible. And I think scientists have a much larger role to play than the one we're currently playing to address the climate and ecological emergency. Um, and I'm saying this because this is another form of collective action. Collective action can take many forms, and I think activism, collective activism, can 
can be one of the most effective ways of doing that. So if you want to think about collective action by scientists for ethical publishing, I encourage you to check out this, this publication. Um, if you're interested in collective action by scientists to prevent climate, ecological, and ultimately societal breakdown, um, I encourage you to check out this, this other publication that we authored uh, last year. Uh, but perhaps you might want to consider uh, something at the intersection of both. Why can't we have both collective action for ethical publishing and to prevent societal breakdown? Uh, and we actually can. Uh, it is possible uh, with a little bit of help from, from our friend uh, Elsevier here, uh, who can give us a helping hand. Uh, because it turns out that El Savior uh, has been revealed through several news articles uh, in the past couple of years to be a major uh, contributor to oil, gas, and, and coal corporations uh, through various activities. Um, there's, a, there's a recent article by the Union of Concerned Scientists sort of summarizing uh, anti-climate practices that, that El Savior is, is currently carrying out, including providing the fossil fuel industry, oil, gas, and, and coal companies with research and development, uh, information as well as data services about where to extract uh, uh, more oil, gas, or coal. Uh, El Savior, and particularly its parent company, Relix, has been lobbying and financially supporting U.S. politicians who block climate action. Uh, there's also been dissemination of information intended to help companies produce, produce more fossil fuels. Um, El Savior has removed barriers to exploring and operating in, in emerging markets and often hosts fossil fuel uh, exhibitions. Um, and you can check out more, uh, you can find out more about this in, in this link uh, that is at the bottom of this slide. Uh, and I'm saying this because there's a new collective campaign um, to address both ethical publishing and the, the anti-climate behavior of, of El Savior. It's called Stop El Savior. Uh, that is calling uh, for, for academics and scientists to help keep fossil fuels out of research. Uh, they have a very nice uh, web page, which I encourage you to check out, stopelsavior.wordpress.com, which provides a lot of, of information and resources for, for academics who want to help take power away from El Savior through different uh, initiatives. And that includes refusing to review. They provide a nice uh, template letter that you can send to an El Savior editor explaining why you're choosing to, to reject a, a peer review request because of the anti-climate behavior of, of El Savior. Um, you can also, they also provide links to various editorial boards. If you can email, uh, explaining why you disagree with the company's fossil fuel ties. Um, they also provide links to uh, governmental agencies in the EU, UK, US, and Australia that are trying to crack down on uh, companies that are pretending like they're sustainable, but are actually engaging in, in greenwashing and sort of pretend climate uh, uh, beneficial behavior. And so there's a lot of uh, organizations that you can you can um, uh, report El Savior to to help prosecute them for for their activities, and there will also be announcements on this website for for direct action for actually actions of, of civil resistance uh, addressing uh, El Savior and its anti climate practices. Uh, so check out this website. There's, there's a lot of information there. Um, I also put the link in the chat. Um, the take home message for my my talk is uh, there's a lot we can do if we organize if we engage in collective action. Uh, I'd like to thank you for listening, and I'm on, on Mastodon at this uh, address. Um, 